Hey friends, welcome back to today's episode of Truth Shots. My name is Jeff Lyle. I have the lovely privilege of serving as the lead pastor of the church at Winder in Bethlehem, Georgia. You always have an invitation to come and join me out there on a Sunday or a Wednesday. But for these Truth Shots episodes, I get to come to you. And so I want you to join me in the 146th Psalm, Psalm 146. I'm going to bring you a message and tell you today why my hope is still in God, why my hope remains in God. That's right. And through all that's going on in life, God remains my hope. And I'm going to tell you why from these ancient words from King David in Psalm 146. So grab a copy of God's Word and let's get into this episode of Truth Shots. You know, you you might even think it's funny before I read these verses. What, why would Jeff bring us... Uh, a message, especially to Christians, which most of you are, um, why would he bring a message telling us to hope in God? Well, because you find all throughout scripture that believers are writing things that say, keep your hope in God. You know, there's something about the faith that can be robust at one moment and then kind of, you know, just go downhill at another moment. And all of us are susceptible to the highs and lows of what it means to feel our faith or to feel hopeful or to feel confident in God. And whereas I would love to just bypass emotions altogether and just say, no, the Christian life is just about your knowledge or just about your soul or just about your spirit. Your emotions are in there somewhere. And so one of the things that the enemy likes to do is he likes to exploit our emotions. And our emotions, quite honestly, are the most fragile, unpredictable parts of who we are as human beings and as Christians. And so it's very important that we allow our spirit to speak to our emotions Because if your emotions are informing your spirit, man, you're going to be all over the map. But if you get strong in hope and confidence in your spirit, then your spirit can instruct your emotions. And sometimes when your emotions are trying to carry you in a negative or a wrong direction, your spirit will just reach out and say, ah, not so fast. Emotions, you submit to the spirit because the spirit is what rules and reigns. So in the psalm, I've got some refreshers in these verses that help me to remember why my hope should always remain in God and not in anybody else and not in anything else. And so look, let's look at these words together from Psalm 146 and let's just see maybe the Holy Spirit does some work in you and maybe the Holy Spirit does some work in me and maybe both of us leave this truth shot together and we find ourselves more confident than ever that God is for us, not against us, and he's not done working yet. Psalm 146, David writes, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked, he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Now, friends, I'm just going to go ahead and risk it. If you're hearing the Holy Spirit, just reading those verses should have helped your soul. I don't even have to say anything, really. And those verses alone should reorient us and bring us to a place where like, oh, yeah, the Lord is in control. The Lord is good. The Lord loves me. And so as I walk us through these verses in our remaining time together, I want you to give yourself permission to receive spiritual encouragement, not a superficial pat on the head, not a attaboy or a go get them tiger. I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm saying let your spirit receive the truth of the word of God and let your emotions bow to what your spirit is receiving. So if you're in a dark place, if you're in a depressed place, if you're in a frightened place because of all the nastiness going on in the world, Well, then I'm just going to appeal to you to go higher. Do what Paul told the church at Colossae in chapter three. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, 
Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection, that means your emotions, your pursuits. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth, for your life is hid with Christ in God. Meaning all of our hope is found in God. And sometimes you have to go back and you have to reconnect to the source of your hope. Sometimes you've got to divert your attention off of the craziness of the world and recenter yourself and fixate on the Lord. And that's when your hope and your confidence and your reassurance is going to start flowing in your life again. David's going to help us do that today in his Psalm, Psalm 146. And I see David in the first two verses like this. I see him as a believer with his mind made up. I like this because David is not waiting for anybody else to help him make up his mind. David said, it's my mind. I'm going to make up my mind, what I believe, what I think, and what I'm feeling. What does it look like? Well, in verse one, he says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I mean, that's awesome. David is talking to his own soul. And his soul maybe needed to be raised up a little bit, be refreshed a little bit, be elevated a little bit. He's saying, soul, I want you to start praising the Lord. I want you to start giving God the glory. I want you to start focusing again on the Lord. Soul, get your attention off of other stuff. And soul, start looking at God. Start looking to the Lord upon his throne. Start looking to the creator. Start looking to the shepherd. Start looking to the redeemer. Start looking to the savior. Start looking to your father. Start doing that, oh my soul. But he goes further. He makes a decision. He says, I got my mind made up. Soul, you start praising the Lord. And then he says, I'm going to praise the Lord as long as I live. That's a bold declaration. You know, it's easy to praise God when your bank account's full, isn't it? It's easy to praise God when your body's young and strong and not struggling at all. It's easy to praise God when you got 15 people that are applauding your every move, your every word, your every decision. Those are easy times when the body's healthy, when the family's good, when your friends are near, when the bank account's full. I mean, that's even even non-believers can give give God the glory, so to speak, in times like that. Why? Because it requires nothing of them. But when you make up your mind that no matter what life hands you, when you make up your mind that through the valley of the shadow of death, even when you walk there, you're going to praise the Lord. When you make up your mind, when you're persecuted, you're going to bless the Lord. When you make up your mind that when you don't have a lot of stuff in a world that is bent on stuff, I mean, we live in a world that is addicted to stuff. And some Christians, you don't, you don't, you don't have a lot of stuff, but can you still praise the Lord? Because the best I can tell you, you probably got food and shelter. And if you're watching this, you either have a television or a computer or a smartphone. And so I'm thinking to myself, we have a lot to praise the Lord about, but you got to make up your mind ahead of time. Don't wait for the good, easy times before you make up your mind. I'm going to praise the Lord as long as I live. How long do you expect to be following Jesus? The rest of eternity will follow him praising, not complaining, not moaning, not groaning, not despairing, not doubting. Those are things you have to battle through, but you battle through them. Make up your mind. You're going to praise the Lord as long as you live. It's not a conditional thing. We don't praise God when we feel like he's being good to us. We praise God no matter what we're feeling, no matter what life is handing, no matter what God has allowed into our life, whether it be beautiful or whether it be very difficult, we're going to praise the Lord. Why? Because he's worthy. He's worthy of our praise no matter what's going on in our life. And David was a believer with his mind made up. He said, I'm going to praise the Lord as long as I live. And I hope you'll do the same. But he also said this, I'm going to sing praises. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Now, what does that mean? That's a strange phrase, while I have my being. What David is saying there is, I'm not just going to praise him on the inside. I'm going to praise him on the outside. Let me give you something here. Christians are people of praise and worship. Worship, you can do privately and you can do quietly. But praise, it's always audible. Worship, I can sit here right now and not say another word. Let the cameras roll and just sit here and I can worship God and you can watch me worship. I don't have to say a thing. But if I'm going to praise the Lord, I'm going to open up my mouth. And David said, I'm going to sing my worship. I'm going to sing my praise. I'm going to do it while I have my being. And that's just a, a, a unique way of saying while I'm still alive. While I am in possession of my faculties, while I can still make up my mind, while my body is still working, while I've still got a mouth, while I've still got a voice, while I have my being, I'm going to sing praises to this God. Friends, there's nothing that'll change an outlook like you getting in the midst of some praise and worship. You get That's why church, one of the reasons church is so important, you get in there among people and where two or more are gathered, there he is in the midst and you're lifting up the songs of the Lord, you're praising the Lord every time when I'm in a worship service, if I will actually be present spiritually in that worship service, 
my mind and my heart are changed and transformed. You know, we have a Wednesday night service here at the church at Winder where I'm filming today. We have a Wednesday night service and most Wednesday nights, it's a smaller crowd. Everybody's a little more tired because we've either worked all day or run to and fro all day. And sometimes my flesh doesn't want to enter into the sanctuary. Can you believe I just admitted that? I just admitted as a pastor that sometimes on those Wednesday services, my flesh doesn't want to enter in. But you know what happens? When Pastor Kent and the team start worshiping, when they start bringing the music, when we start lifting up our voices, it doesn't take 60 seconds before my flesh has to take a back seat to my spirit. Why? Because I made up my mind. I will praise the Lord forever. And when that music hits and singing happens, it changes the internal atmosphere of my heart. And then it changes the external atmosphere in that room. Some of you today, maybe if you're gloomy and doomy right now, just turn off the news, man. Turn off the negativity. Turn off all the nastiness out there and get your favorite praise and worship music on and get your voice engaged in praising and worshiping the Lord. Make up your mind. David did. And I believe you and I can too. But let's get back into David's words in Psalm 146. So he's a believer with his mind made up, but he's also a worshiper with his eyes wide open. That's in verses three and four. David is a believer and because he's a believer, he's a worshiper, but his eyes are wide open. What does that mean? Well, he's not living this fantasy fairy tale kind of faith. There's a lot of people that subscribe to faith in Jesus and it's almost like they live in a fantasy land. They, they say, well, because I'm in Christ, I, I, I never have difficulty. And if you're walking in faith, you'll never get sick. And if you, if you just do what's right, you always obey, which by the way, nobody always obeys. But if you do, then you're never going to have trouble and everything's going to go your way. Well, that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible shows us that the most faithful, committed, sacrificial, spirit-filled people in the Word of God all suffered. They all went through difficulty. They were always the object of attack, both by demons, by the devil, and by people. So this fantasy land of being a worshiper, and if I just worship and walk with the Lord, I'll never have any problems, I'll never have any trouble, that's just not biblical. So what did David have his eyes open to? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me, let me show you from verse number three. He, he gives this caution to us because his eyes have been opened. As he saw God, he also saw people for what they were. And therefore he said, do not put your trust in princes. Now, David himself was a king. David knew about human royalty. He knew about human authority and human power. But David never really viewed himself primarily as a king. He viewed himself as a child of God who happened to work as a king and serve as a king. But David was wise enough to say, don't you trust in human royalty? Don't you trust in human power? Don't you trust in human position? Don't lean on the arm of flesh and put your life leaning hard against people because people, even the princes among the people, will let you down. They'll fail you. In other words, he's about to tell us, don't trust man, trust God. Now, friends, we all have certain people in our lives to whom we must give some trust. If you're in a marriage, you have to trust your spouse. If you're in a family or a spiritual family, you have to trust some of those people in that family. But I'm just going to go ahead and tell you something. Your fullest and most sound, firm trust should not be in people because the best of people can fail. And sometimes people that we put our trust in actually take that trust and misuse it. They actually violate that trust. It's not always a violation. Sometimes it's just people we trust or human and they fail us. But what David is saying here is that as he worships God, he sees God for who God is and he sees people for who they are. Now, I want to tell you, we need to have some level of confidence in those that are leading us. It's very important in the church that you be in a church where you have confidence in the spiritual leaders in that church. But ultimately, as a spiritual leader, I'll just say this, all spiritual leaders fail the followers sometimes. And by the way, followers fail spiritual leaders. And what we can't do is put so much confidence in people that when somebody fails us, we start thinking, oh, no, I'm not going to put my trust in anybody. We have to have a modicum of trust in people. But ultimately, our trust should not be our fullest and final trust should not be in people. That is reserved for God alone. Why does David say that this is important that we don't put our trust in princes? Well, he says in verse three, we don't do that because they're all sons of man. They're all human is what he's saying there, in whom there is no salvation. It's a very important thought. Like the deepest work that you need in your life, the deepest provisions, the deepest protections, 
the most unnecessary promotions, there's no salvation. There's no power in man to bring those to you. Now, you can look at it in the strictest sense of the word, meaning this. There's no spiritual salvation in a person, no pope, no priest, no pastor. Those people can't save us, no prophet. But beyond what he's talking about in the sense of being saved or justified, we know that there's only one name by whom we must be saved, and that is the name Jesus Christ the Lord. We know that. But we sometimes look at people as mini saviors, little tiny miniature saviors. And I'm going to lean on this person because they'll always be there. And then one day they're not. Well, I'm going to trust this person because they're going to open doors for me. And then one day they don't open any doors for you. Well, I've got this fallback plan. If everything else falls apart, I got this fallback plan. And then where do you fall when your fallback plan falls away? So what David is saying is, man, people are people. They're just sons of men. They're trying to figure out their way. They're they're in process. They're, They're not glorified. They're not God. And so he's saying, don't put your full trust in people. Because ultimately, there's going to arise a situation where a person can't help you. Do you know that God constructs your life that you will eventually hit spots in your life where no human being can help you? Your spouse can't help you. Your parents can't help you. Your children can't help you. No spiritual leader can help you. God wants to ordain our lives so that in the heart of hearts, we know that ultimately God is our help in a time of trouble. And so David is saying here, My eyes are wide open. As I worship God, I also see what God is. And because of that, I see what people aren't. And so don't ever get uh, confused about who your real hope and your real trust is. My hope remains in God, even when people fail me or if I fail people. Ultimately, our hope needs to be in God. And so David says down in verse number four, he reminds us that when people are our trust, we're on faulty ground because when a man's breath departs, He returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. That's just kind of a sober, almost like an intense way of saying, don't put your hope in people because they die. Now, he's not saying, you know, live your life as a hermit, never trusting anybody. He's just saying when you love people and when you place trust in people, don't treat them as idols. Don't treat them as little mini gods, miniature gods. You don't ever want to have your your heart's worship go to a person. Why? Because those people die and they return to the earth. We bury our loved ones. We bury those that have helped us. We bury those that we look to. It's, it's a very sad day when that happens, but we should know ahead of time when a man of God dies, nothing of God himself dies. When a woman of God dies, nothing of God himself is buried. Ultimately, people are temporary in our lives. Therefore, we should not put our fullest confidence, hope, or trust in the best of human beings. They may be wonderful people, but they're not worthy of your fullest trust in the sense of you stake your whole life on what this person is or is not going to do. They they return to the earth, and the day that they're buried, all their plans perish with them. Every good intention every ounce of willingness to help you, every resource they might have had, every ability to stand in the gap and show up in your time of need. If you're relying on people, there's going to come a day where that person you're relying on won't be able to help you. And so God says, rely on me. That's why your hope needs to be in him. I I want to give this quick word. Some of you lost your hope in God because a person failed you. Or maybe God didn't leave that person who had become your rock. And when that rock of a person was no longer in your life, you felt like you had no rock. When God has been saying all along, I'm your rock. I'm the one you were supposed to trust in. I'm the one you can't live without. And now that this person is gone and you feel like you lost your rock, I just want to say, when we lose our human rock um, that was never supposed to be our rock to begin with, when we lose that person, it's a new opportunity to say from this day forward, God, you will be my rock I will have my hope only in you. So that may be a difficult moment for some of you. I just feel the tenderness of the Lord right now that some of you have buried loved ones. Some of you have been abandoned by a spouse that you thought was your rock. Some of you had to say goodbye to children or parents and they were a huge part of your life. And you feel that emptiness and that sadness and that disconnect. But I want to tell you, the Lord's not upset. He hasn't disappeared. But he is waiting for you to make a decision, to make up your mind. You're going to worship him. You're going to praise him. You're going to trust him again. You're going to welcome him to take that primary place in your life where he is the central source of your hope 
and your confidence. You can go on. You must go on. He's not done with you yet. But if you're going to go on, do it knowing that the Lord alone is your hope. So let me get down to these last few verses, and this will encourage a lot of you. I see David earlier in these verses as a believer with his mind made up, and then I saw him as a worshiper with his eyes wide open. But in verses 5 through 10, I see him as a traveler with his hope nailed down. A traveler with his hope nailed down. He's moving through life just like you are, just like I am. We're pilgrims. We're passing through. I know we, we've heard that before, but have you stopped recently to feel it? Like this world's not your home. The way things are here is not going to be the way things are forever. Like we, we tend to live with this amnesia that God's going to radically change everything that we can see on planet Earth. Like this isn't as good as it's going to get, nor has it ever been as good as it's going to get. You know, we talk about making America great again, and we're talking about bringing back, build back better, and all these political slogans. I'm like, man, my hope's not in the government. The government can't build what I need built. America's greatness is good. I would much prefer America to be great rather than America to be the footstool of the rest of the world. But that's not where my hope is. My hope as a traveler through this world, my hope's nailed down just like David's was. My hope is in the coming kingdom to planet Earth. You heard me right. Your king is coming back. King Jesus is coming back to Earth. And in the meantime, God says, I want you to trust me because I am going to provide what you need and I have compassion, I have mercy, I have care. I never forget those whom the world forgets. I never overlook those whom the world overlooks. Every single created person in the image of God is important to the Lord himself. So let's see how he expresses that in these verses. He says in verse number five, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, if you know anything about Jacob, Jacob was kind of a scoundrel in the Bible. Jacob was ruthless. Jacob wasn't godly. He had godly appetites, but he was a bit of a, a manipulator. He was kind of a liar. He was a schemer. And before he had that wrestling match with the son of God, well, Jacob was living one way, but God never gave up on Jacob. And God pinned Jacob to the ground that day and caused Jacob to walk differently after that wrestling match than he would ever walk before. And so when I think that the title is used here, blessed whose help is the God of Jacob, the person whose help is the God of Jacob, the God of Jacob met Jacob in his weakness. The God of Jacob met Jacob in his sin. The God of Jacob never gave up on Jacob, even though Jacob was trying to live for himself. But there comes that time where we see ourselves as Jacob and we recognize God comes to us in our weakness and he is our help. Therefore, he is our hope. Hey, friend, let me just say this. If God hasn't given up on you this far, he's not about to do it. He's had plenty of reasons to walk away from me and he never has. And even when I've acted like Jacob, even when I've lived for myself, even when I've been a manipulator or a schemer or a deceiver or any of those things, those are hard words to say about oneself. But honestly, we've all had moments like that. And God never gave up on us. And so he's wanting to communicate. If I've never given up on you to this point, I never will. I'm the God of Jacob and I want to help you. But he also said in verse six that I'm the God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And I keep faith forever. That's what God says. I keep faith forever, meaning I'm faithful. God wants you to know I created everything. I don't, I don't lack any power. I don't lack any authority. Everything God says belongs to him. It's all his, the earth and the fullness thereof, the cosmos, the galaxies, everything. The whole universe is his. God's not up there saying, man, I wish I could help you, but I'm, I'm out of stuff. I don't have any resources. That's a silly thought, but a lot of people live as if God doesn't have the means to help them. And God says, I want you to be assured that I, the creator of the entire universe, I know your name. I know where you are, and I'm going to be faithful forever. And then he says, I'm also the God, verse seven, who executes justice for the oppressed. Now that's very important because we live in a, in a culture of multiple types of oppression. I mean, it's there, it's real. People don't like to admit it, but other people wanna view themselves as the constant victim of oppression. Hey, look, we're born where we're born. We're born in the generation we're born into. We can't do anything to un undo how and when and the place where we were born. But I don't, I don't want us to be, believe that we're victims of our temporary birth status, racially, nationally, socially. 
look, we're overcomers. If Jesus can overcome the grave, we can overcome the oppression that might come against us. And some of you need to recognize, because some of you are, are privileged and you don't believe in oppression. Uh, get your head out of the sand. There's oppression. And God says, I'm a God of justice and I will set that right. And so some of us need to recognize that God hates oppression and God loves justice. And for those of you that are suffering in any way from that, I want you to be reminded he hears you. He'll help you. Your hope is in him. He will bring justice to the oppressed. He also gives food to the hungry, according to verse 7. It means he's going to meet your most basic needs. A lot of us have failed to understand the difference between a want and a need, a luxury and a necessity. But if you'll slow down a little bit and kind of divorce yourself from this appetite for luxuries, you'll recognize you have everything you need today and you'll have it again tomorrow. Why? Because he's the God who's satisfied and feeds the hungry. He sets the prisoners free. He opens the eyes of the blind. He lifts up those who are bowed down. Why don't I just finish right there? See, the Lord likes to set captives free, and he does it spiritually through the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you are captives to your sin. You're captives to your circumstances. You're captives to what's happened to you in life. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants to open your blind eyes spiritually by the gospel. And I'm here to tell you, he lived, he died, he rose again. Jesus paid the price for all of our guilt and all of our iniquity. And he's waiting for you to commit yourself to him by faith, believing that he died for you believing that he came after you when you were a lost sinner. And now as a savior, he'll welcome you into the family of God, but you've got to repent. You've got to trust. And when that happens, your prison shackles come off of you. Your blind eyes are open and he lifts you up after you've lived so long bowed down in sin and ignorance of God. I don't know where you are today, but I do want to say this. No matter where you are, he's the God of hope and your hope can remain in him. If you have your hope in anything else, it's a faltering hope. It'll let you down. But if you'll do like David did and make up your mind that you're going to praise the Lord all day long, that you're going to sing with your soul, that you're not going to wait on circumstances to be favorable before you start professing and declaring the goodness of God while you still have your being, while you're still in the land of the living. And for those of you that aren't yet in Christ, can I make this very gentle but clear appeal to you? What does it profit you if you were to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? You need to call on the name of the Lord today. You need to recognize, like the rest of us have, that there comes a day where we're not the exception of the rule and we know it and we bow our hearts to Jesus Christ. So friend, as this broadcast comes to an end, this is what I want to tell you. Get on your knees, fall on your face, and commit your life to Jesus Christ. Say to the Lord, Lord, I'm yours today, and I'm replacing, I'm putting again, my confidence and my hope in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time.